All right, hello everyone. And if you haven't noticed the title of this video, welcome to probably the most unnecessarily in-depth uh, and lengthy, I wouldn't call it tier list, but guide to classes that I think anyone has really put out for, uh, for XCOM 2. Um, do yourself a favor, listen to this intro real quick. I'm gonna list timestamps below for all the classes and where I feel that they rank, but I do wanna lay out a few ground rules before we start. Or not so much ground rules, but my, my train of thought for why I thought this tier list was necessary. Uh, so first and foremost, when we move into discussing soldier abilities, this tree down here under XCOM, the randomly generated ones that you get with the training center, we're not going to take this into consideration at all. Um, I feel a lot of the times when I look back on some of the older tier lists, people will say, oh, you know, the, the Templar, for example, if we go down here to our, our Templar. Oh man, if you get Reaper on Templar, it's so good because you can chain all these really high power uh, slashes together and yada, yada, yada. But because that's so RNG dependent and you won't always have that on your playthroughs, I feel that it's only fair if for a, a, a true tier list on how good a particular class is, we use only the abilities that are given to you in vanilla. Um, also for each of the tier lists, because there will be three, we're going to do a early game, a mid game, and a late game tier list. And while yes, you can most certainly have a kernel, let's say, by lit, uh, late early game, you know, early mid game, um, just for simplicity's sake, I'm gonna say the early game will consist of only corporal and sergeant ranks. Mid game will consist of only lieutenant and captain ranks and major and colonel will belong to the uh, the late game uh, now mid game for me and late game for me um, it it can depend on what your you know, stance is uh, like what what signifies the start of the mid game or the late game for your playthrough to me mid game starts when you get the second tier of armor powered armor um, that allows you to use custom ammunition and gives your soldiers a lot more survivability, um, which is the one thing that you really struggle with in the early game. In late game, typically, again, you could say it's maybe beam weapons, but uh, once you get warden armor, and uh, that's what the normal armor is called, right? Um, yeah, the tier three armor is typically when I would say late game is uh, should be considered. Um, but if you, if you stuck through and, and listened to that, that will explain I'm kind of doing three different tier lists and, tier lists and um, why I kind of felt that this was necessary just because as I mentioned, so many tier lists, they kind of give a blanket statement like, oh, Rangers are really good. And I agree Rangers are really good, but how good are they at particular points in the game? And why are they good at particular points in the game more importantly? So I'm going to go ahead, uh, as per you know most tier list videos, I'm going to go over each of the abilities, talk about what they do. Squatty, for our ranger to start off with, we have Slash, allows you to slash an enemy with your sword. Uh, and then we move into the Corporal abilities, which are Blade Master and Phantom. Uh, now, there's a case to be made that with uh, War of the Chosen and the Reaper class, Phantom is not as necessary of a perk to take. Uh, I want to say this was for this particular playthrough. I want to say that this guy was one of my original rangers, so I took Blade Master on him. Um, Phantom can be incredibly useful for rangers in that one, it allows you to have basically a ranger, or excuse me, a, a reaper on, on missions that you're not taking a reaper with you. Uh, and, and two, if you combine it with Shadow Strike, which for this tier list, intents and purposes we'll say is another early game bonus um, you get bonus aim and bon bonus critical hit chance um, which is great with shotguns because they already have a really high critical hit chance um, phantom i think is kind of overshadowed by blade master though especially in the early game because of the extra aim and the extra damage that blade master gives you um, we go into looking at the stats for a regular sword here. Anywhere from four to six damage, you knock that up to six to eight. 
that basically guarantees that you'll always get a kill on uh, on troopers early game because you'll you'll have the additional aim and even uh, the the officers which I believe have seven health until they get the the bonus health which really you just have to roll a 66 percent on your on your damage in order to to kill them if you're rolling a six to eight so I personally really like blade master it also makes dealing with uh, sectoids since they, they have that melee uh, not immunity uh, they're susceptible to, to melee damage they're they're weak against it so you get the extra damage off them is what I'm trying to say um, but yeah both of these are really good skills um, I personally personally would value blade master a little bit more uh, just so I have more guaranteed damage guaranteed damage going out uh, however later when you get more rangers I think phantom is is also a good choice as well uh, moving into sergeant shadow strike as I kind of mentioned with phantom it, it pairs very well with it and when we get into the mid game uh, pay, uh, pair very well with conceal as well and then shadow step or shadow strike and shadow step um, shadow step you don't trigger overwatch um, this is just nice in general because especially on legendary when you start running into the advent mechs a lot of the time when they activate uh, the the pod activates the the mechs will typically just stand in place and overwatch so having a unit that can still move around freely and not worry about triggering overwatch is nice in case you don't have a good shot on on that advent mech um, However, Shadow Strike is, is very nice, especially if you have Phantom and then eventually Conceal. So moving into the mid-game, which is our Lieutenant and Captain ranks. And by the way, we'll do the uh, the tier list at, at the very last point in this video. So uh, again, check out the time stamps down below. If you, don't, if you know what all these abilities do and you just want to see how I rank uh, the classes individually, skip ahead to that. Um, but yeah, Conceal, you get to go back into a Concealment. It's really, really useful, uh, especially if you want a scout that isn't a Reaper. Uh, especially when you're playing on Legendary in an Iron Man, having a scout is almost a necessity. You can get away with it if you uh, if you know the pod layouts, if that makes sense. Like, after you play this game so much, you can kind of tell, hey, there's more than likely going to be a pod here after I ran into the first pod, and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, just having that extra information that you can get from a scout is, is very useful. Uh, running gun, probably one of the best abilities in the game, if you want me to be completely honest. Uh, the ability to double move and shoot, throw a grenade, throw a mimic beacon, uh, trigger, well you can't trigger like an ability like uh, rapid fire with running gun, but um, yeah, just that extra flexibility is, is very nice. Moving into our other mid-game uh, attributes, we have Implaceable and Bladestorm. Both of these, I think, are really good. I think people... Oh, I don't want to say overvalued Bladestorm a little bit. It's definitely a great ability, the fact that you get a free sword swing if someone runs past you. Um, however, my philosophy on playing XCOM 2 and in an optimal way is you never want the enemy to have a turn now obviously that's not going to happen um, pure and simple however normally if you're that close to an enemy to where they're running up with you you're probably out of position a little bit um, and while yes having a free sword swing is nice um, I I can't tell you exactly what the percent chance to hit on a blade storm like it's affected by uh, a modifier like Overwatch's, but it feels like blade storm is not as nice even if you have blade master it's not as accurate, in, in, especially for me. I, maybe it's just something I deal with, but it feels like it misses more often than not. Uh, that being said. Whenever reinforcements get called in and you just plop a ranger down right in that little you know red smoke where you know Advent's gonna drop, you get some free sword swings off, that's pretty nice, especially if you pair it with an overwatch. Uh, moving into Implaceable, this is a really useful ability. Um, the main use for rangers is flanking targets and getting really close to them so that the shotgun, which 
has a, a fantastic aim modifier when you get close up. Um, take a, a, a killing shot, you know, you deal a, a crit shot onto, you know, an advent trooper or whatever, and then you get to move afterwards. So even if you're not in an advantageous position, like you have to run out in the open in order to get a, a flanking shot on, on anything, as long as you kill that unit, you can run back into cover. Fantastic, fast, fantastic ability, highly, highly recommend. Uh, so moving into the late game abilities for the Ranger, we have Deep Cover and Untouchable. I cannot ever say I have ever taken Deep Cover. Um, why you would ever not attack with a Ranger is kind of beyond me. Um, I guess if you want to do an Overwatch creep, I guess this is okay, but if you're doing an Overwatch creep, you probably haven't triggered the pod, so why would it matter if you're in deep cover or not, or if you've hunkered down or not? Um, this just feels like a waste of an ability. Don't take it. I honestly can never think of a reason I would ever want this. Um, meaning that Untouchable is the clear other choice, and Untouchable is, again, if, if run and gun isn't the best ability for the ranger, Untouchable definitely is. Because if you get a kill, not only can you run away into cover, but you can also make sure that an attack doesn't hurt you. Which, while I mentioned you don't want the the enemies to have a turn, this is an incredibly powerful ability that allows you a margin of error um, in case things don't quite go your way and, and a ranger is in a less than advantageous spot. And then finally, moving on to Colonel, we have Rapid Fire and Reaper. Uh, really, either of these kind of comes down to personal preference. Uh, my main beef with Reaper is the later into the game, when you get a Colonel, the higher the health of the enemies. So more than likely, you're not going to be able to kill an enemy in just one sword slash, especially after um, you lose one damage. From, from Reaper's, uh, I guess, negative ability. In, in that, after you score a kill, your next sword slash will deal one less damage. So I kind of like the, again, the flexibility that Rapid, rapid Fire gives you. Um, the fact that you can shoot twice and it's not like Chain Shot on the Grenadier where you have to land the first hit is pretty invaluable. Um, guaranteed two shots, probably gonna be fairly close to the target anyway, so the aim penalty of minus 15. It'll probably drop, you know, a 100% chance to hit down to an 85 between two shots, which isn't that big of a deal. But yeah, that's general opinion on Ranger. Uh, I don't want to spend too, too much time on all these abilities because there are tons of other guides out there. And I have a feeling this video is going to be crazy long anyway. So let's go ahead and move on into the Grenadier. Um, Grenadier's only squad A ability is launch grenade. Shoot a grenade out of the grenade launcher fantastic ability so for our early game abilities we have blast padding and shredder so blast padding the only reason i have that on this playthrough is just because i had extra soldier ap laying around on this guy and i knew i wasn't going to take anything else with him so gave him blast padding um shredder is just so good the ability to remove armor from uh from enemies especially late game when even you know advent troopers uh your shield bears especially uh advent mechs things like that when they start to get armor uh, the little yellow bars for those of you who are unfamiliar with that what that is um it's just it's so valuable and the fact that you, if you can combo it with things like chain shot and take away even more armor is fantastic uh so talking about blast padding you get extra armor on your grenadier and you take less damage from explosive attacks but the problem with taking less damage from explosive attacks is normally if you're let's say standing next to a car and it gets blown up or an enemy throws a grenade at you and it blows up on you you're probably gonna die anyway depending on how many enemies are left because more than likely you're gonna be out of cover at that point or if you're next to a car, a car blowing up just does so much damage coupled with the grenade blowing up that, especially early game, I don't feel like this gives you enough utility. Now that being said, you can totally skip Shredder and come back to it later on. 
had I known I wasn't going to be spending this uh, all this soldier's AP on some of the other things in, in the tree up here, I definitely would have taken blast padding, especially early game, because most of the enemies you run into aren't going to have armor on them, at least not until I want to say maybe late early game. But then you run into the problem of, well, I don't have the advanced warfare unit up, so I can't skill this in. So blast padding to me is just kind of a weird talent. Like you could take it and you'd be okay with it, but Shredder is just that much better. Uh, so moving into Sergeant, Demolition and Suppression. Both of these are kind of mediocre in my opinion, with one being slightly less mediocre than the other. Uh, starting with Demolition, you can uh, you can destroy cover. That's, that's basically it. Um, the problem with Demolition is your Grenadier has two grenades, unless you replace a grenade with something else. Um, and while it is the Grenadier's job to get rid of cover with his grenades, in what world do you typically use two grenades plus the grenades on all your other guys that you bring along with you and you still need to get rid of more cover? Um, I, if, if you're at that point where you use two grenades plus let's say you have a ranger, a specialist, and a uh, a sharpshooter and your sharpshooter has a flashbang so you have four grenades in total you realistically especially in the early game should be able to kill all of the pods all three of the pods you'll typically run into on a legendary playthrough with three grenades uh, with the larger blast radius that uh, the grenadier oh i'm sorry uh, four grenades the, the larger blast radius that these grenades from the grenadier give you allows you to remove so much cover that the other classes that you bring along with you essentially just pick off damaged targets. Or it, it, or if they're not damaged, they're standing out in the open because they blew you blew up their cover. Um, so that really leaves suppression. Um, and suppression is, again, kind of a fallback talent for me to where, hey, I, I killed all the targets that I could, but there's one enemy left and I only have one, uh, one unit left, and that's my Grenadier. And I don't think I can kill that last unit. I'm just going to suppress it, and that essentially ensures that either the alien will take an overwatch shot, or it's going to shoot at one of my guys in place and it's going to have a massive aim penalty on it. So two not so great abilities, I just think suppression is a little bit better. Uh, very, very situational for both of them. So moving into uh, the lieutenant and captain tree for the mid game, heavy ordnance. Um, basically just gives you an extra grenade for your uh, grenade only slots um, to show you what the grenade only slot is because I think sometimes there is a little bit of confusion about what that is is if we go out here to the loadout this is the grenade only slot let me find someone who doesn't have armor on them uh, yeah so this is the utility item which Obviously, you can see he has another grenade like all Grenadiers would. And then this is the grenade only slot. So you only get one extra grenade, you don't get two. Just something important to keep in mind. Um, again, I think this is a really good uh, item to pick up. It just means that you have the ability to do the Grenadier's job more effectively and for a longer period of time. Um, and it allows your other classes to do more useful things other than throwing a grenade if need be. Moving into hollow targeting. Um, I, I personally like hollow targeting quite a bit. I know some people don't really care for it, um, but against units that ha have high defense like your sectopods, your gatekeepers, um, even if I can't get a really good hit off on a really high defense enemy or an enemy that's you know in really deep cover and it's too far away even after I've moved my grenadier to get a grenade on him if I give myself plus 15 uh, against let's say an advent trooper that's in full cover that can substantially increase the likelihood that we hit that target um, again this is just kind of a, a fallback uh, safety net ability uh, in these two picks right here. 
moving into captain uh, we have volatile mix and chain shot um, the plus two damage on grenades is just okay in my opinion um, throwing grenades is the grenadier's job but to me it will always be first and foremost to get rid of cover and not to kill enemies and a lot of the time, especially when you get into the later part of the game, even when you have plasma grenades, you're not going to be dealing enough damage with volatile mix to be able to one-shot an advent trooper with the plus two damage on a grenade. So I'd, rather, I'd much rather take something like chain shot, and let's say I'm fighting a sectopod or a gatekeeper, I'll throw a hollow target on that gatekeeper with one grenadier, which essentially offsets the chain shot that I have on another grenadier. And you also are shredding a ton of armor on that on that gatekeeper as well. Um, now there are definitely more efficient ways to take down a gatekeeper, but that's just to me a good example as to why you would why you would take chain shot. Um, I also typically will throw scopes on top of my cannons because of chain shot. You throw on a superior scope, you essentially negate the penalty of chain shot. Um, it's a very very powerful ability. Um, I think people they see the negative 15 penalty on it and they just assume that it's bad but if you have a superior scope and let's say you don't have any more upgrades for your cannon other than that um in, in terms of the weapon upgrades you can just do a superior scope and a superior auto reloader you don't need an expanded magazine or anything crazy like that and you can still um reliably put out chain shot damage um fairly consistently and even better if you get the uh i can't remember the name of the tech you research but it gives you an additional weapon slot upgrade on your on your cannons then you can throw a superior uh extended mag on there and then all of a sudden you have six shots that you can reload for free three times in a mission and you can just throw out chain shots like crazy um Again, I between these two, I would rather take the the extra damage just because I tend to play fairly aggressive in my in my play style. But um, if you do want the extra damage from grenades and just spam the enemy with grenades, there's something to be said for that too. Um, the one thing I want to I, I probably should have said originally when I I started doing this tier list is just saying that this is all in my experience. Um, and yeah, I mean, do what you want. For the late game up, uh, abilities for the Grenadier, we have Salvo and Hail of Bullets. Um, the ability to do the Grenadier's job even better by making it so that throwing your grenade only costs one action instead of two is pretty amazing. Um, Hail of Bullets is nice. The fact that you can use, I want to say it's three ammo, maybe it's two. I want to say it's three, uh, three shots in your magazine to, to do guaranteed damage. That's good, but so is also just throwing a grenade to eliminate cover from an enemy and then being able to shoot them or hollow target them. Uh, I, I think that Salvo is a must take on all your Grenadiers. It just makes them more effective at doing their role. Um, and that bring, brings us into Colonel with Saturation, Fire, and Rupture. To saturation fire you basically place down a cone you uh you use again i want to say this is t i think this one is two ammo um and then uh basically you, you fire in the cone you use up that ammo and you can hit all the tiger targets that are in that cone important thing to note about sat saturation fire though it is not guaranteed damage it's not like the shredder cannon that you can get on your armor um there is a chance to miss. It will also uh, typically destroy cover. Um, it, it feels like it will pretty consistently do that, but it will not always hit. And then rupture. Um, this one is kind of hard for me to pick between which one I like the most. The problem with rupture, in my opinion, is you deal critical damage when you hit the target. But the plus three from all attacks, it it takes so long for that to give you a substantial benefit in a lot of cases. Like let's say you're fighting one of the chosen, right? You're fighting the assassin, you rupture the assassin, um, 
after you've ruptured the assassin, let's say you, with your critical hit, you did 12 damage on a 40 health assassin. You got rid of all of her armor. She now has, um, that'd be 28 health left. So I could run up with a ranger and shoot the assassin and get three extra damage. And let's say, again, um, because we're in late game, the, the ranger has the, the storm cannon. They're probably going to do, instead of, let's just say, 12 damage, they do 15 damage. Well, you still have to do another, what? 13 damage, right? Yeah, uh, close enough. I, I, I'm sure you can kind of see my point is the three extra damage is kind of marginal to where... And that's not even if the, the ranger gets a crit, too. It does even more damage then. The, the three damage won't typically push you from having to shoot that chosen from two shots from three shots. Um, I probably explained that really poorly, but um, I, I, I don't feel like the extra three of damage just is enough to warrant uh, placing a rupture on some targets sometimes. I usually do it just to put the extra damage there in case I need it, but it oftentimes doesn't feel like it's a necessity is, is what I'm trying to say but yeah that's the uh, that's the grenadier let's move into sharpshooter so for squatty with our sharpshooters um, we have squad sight which basically just means uh, as long as you can see an enemy with uh, within a squad mate's line of sight you can see it as long as you have line of sight on that enemy which basically means um, let's say your ranger is behind or your ranger is in front of your your sharpshooter and because they're let's say 10 meters in front of the, the sharpshooter they have enough line of sight to see an alien in front of them that means the sharpshooter can see them however if that ranger is looking around a corner behind a building the sharpshooter won't be able to see that alien through the building um unlike they can with um well, it, I guess it just depends on how wonky the, the line of sight is for the buildings. But um, yeah, basically what I'm trying to say, as long as your other people have vision on, on someone, you can you can see them as well. Uh, and then fire pistol, which means you can shoot a pistol. So moving into the early game abilities, uh, we have long watch and we have return fire. Um, return fire is horrible, horrible talent. Don't take it. You don't want your sharpshooter to be shot at. They're typically going to be in the back line. Uh, unless you're going for a gunslinger sort of build, which is typically how I play my sharpshooters. Um, and then you have long watch, which allows you to use overwatch with squad sight up here. So again, you don't have to see the alien directly as long as one of your others, uh, other units can see an alien, you can take an overwatch shot on. Uh, moving into the sergeant talents Deadeye, you take a minus, I want to say this is minus 10, it might be minus 15 uh, aim penalty, and you get a pretty decent, I want to say it's plus 3 uh, damage onto a target. This is pretty good. The problem with Deadeye, at least until you train up your aim on your sharpshooters and, and get superior scopes and things like that, is early game you just can't hit a lot of targets with your sharpshooter. Um, a lot of the time, even if you're shooting at a target that's out of cover, from a fair distance away, you'll have maybe a 75 to 80 percent chance to hit. It may not sound horrible, but for those of you who know that XCOM is XCOM, you're probably going to miss a lot of those 75 to 80 percent shots. Um, and I like to have a little bit more reliability in my in my ability to hit those targets. So moving into lightning hands, uh, you get to shoot a pistol for free. This is a great ability, and it pairs very, very well with the uh, the gunslinger talents later on down the road, which I actually think makes the sharpshooter shine in ways that some people may not appreciate. Um, finishing off with the mid-game talents for the sharpshooter, we have Death from Above. You basically kill an enemy from uh, from a building anywhere where you have an, an aim bonus. You're above an enemy. Um, and you get one more action. Uh, and then quick draw, you can shoot your pistol and it doesn't end your turn. Um, speaking about Death From Above first, if Death From Above was on any other class, it would be God tier. However, for the sharpshooter, it's just kind of meh. 
tier. And that's because you have to have two actions in order to shoot your sniper rifle. So until you get the chosen sniper rifle, you can kill an enemy from a, a position up above and you'll get another action, but you'll only be able to shoot your pistol at that point, which depending on how you have your sniper built isn't ideal um, and it, it doesn't have the same combo potential that it does later on when you, when you have the hunter's rifle. Um, that being said, I actually think quick draw is a really good ability. Even though I was just talking about how being able to shoot your pistol after you uh, you kill an enemy from above, I, I actually think being able to shoot your pistol twice is actually really good. Um, one of the main reasons that I wanted to specify that the mid game for me starts when you have armor level two is probably for this ability right here. And one of the reasons that I think sharpshooters are actually a pretty good unit. Um, throw blue screen rounds into your sharpshooter. You don't even have to upgrade the pistol and you can deal out some serious damage against advent mechs, let alone after you get the, the hunter's pistol, which ignores armor. Um, but I'll talk about that a little bit later when we get to fan fire or not. Uh, yeah, it is fan fire. Um, but yeah, this, uh, this ability, you can basically two shot with just a regular pistol, the regular advent mech, the, the white one. Uh, and then the red advent mech, you can typically lightning hands, pistol shot, pistol shot, a red mech, uh, before they get their health buff later on in the game. So kind of an underrated talent. Um, if you combo this with death from a shoot, a trooper, finish them off, off lightning hands, a white mech, quick draw, another, uh, pistol shot onto a white mech, you, you killed two enemies in one turn, which for the mid game is actually pretty good. Um, moving into Captain Rank, we have Kill Zone. Highly, highly overrated skill by, I don't want to say a lot of people, but um, I think a lot of us have seen those YouTube videos where you see, like, oh, the old one where, you know, two pods have, activa pods have activated and this, this sharpshooter that's perched up on a skyscraper somewhere gets all six of their extended mag shots land and they kill all six of the advent troopers. In actuality, normally, at least in my experience, kills, uh, kill zone will trigger on half of the targets that it should. Like it feels a little wonky sometimes, the, the detection for the overwatch shot. And then because you're taking overwatch shots, you're taking a pretty severe aim penalty, um, which makes it far less likely for these, these shots to hit, unfortunately. So that takes us into face off, which I actually a pretty darn good talent, good talent. Um, being able to shoot at every target that's visible is pretty nutty, especially if the lost are involved. Um, there, are, there are some situations where I've been able to deal 100 plus damage because I basically took a pistol shot at a bunch of lost, some advent, um, even the chosen. Um, and it doesn't have to be amazing damage, um, rack up a ton of kills it's just spreading out spreading out damage especially on those losses and things like that so that another class can just walk in um, you get a guaranteed kill on some of those five or six health loss that you may have some trouble killing with um, with weapons that deal a little bit damage a little bit less damage um, but yeah, face off really good, especially with blue screen rounds against advent mech targets. It's really, really good. Uh, moving into major, we have steady hands and aim. Um, two, again, really meteor abilities. Um, um, you're pretty much going to be stationary a majority of the time. So steady hands is good because you get aim and critical hit chance. Um, and then if you're taking it like why would you hunker down when you're with with your sh sharpshooter you get 20 extra aim but like wouldn't you want to try and deal out some damage on the turn that you're currently fighting the aliens not the next turn and have a better chance to hit and aim just seems really bad to me especially because you have to hunker down in order to use it um so steady hands is just kind of the the only other option and then moving into Colonel, for the last of the late game abilities for the Sharpshooter, we have Serial, we have Fanfire. Um, so I'm going to so talk about Fanfire first, because I had mentioned it previously. So 
Hunter's Pistol. Um, you can solo kill a gatekeeper with a sharpshooter. With, um, with the quick draw ability, with lightning hands. If, let's say, the gatekeeper comes up to you and um, you take one shot with lightning hands, one shot with quick draw, which doesn't end your turn, and then you get three more shots with fanfire with the blue screen rounds, you can typically kill a gatekeeper that way. Um, this is an underrated ability in my opinion it's super super strong with blue screen rounds um however it is fighting which is just a better version of death from above basically uh, in a sense yes you don't have to be up on a building or an elevated position in order to trigger it um but the fact that you get all of your actions not just one action refunded means that you don't have to have the hunters uh or the, yeah, the hunter's sniper rifle equipped in order to make use of cereal. You can just chain targets over and over and over again. Really, really strong ability, really good action economy, um, which is the name of the game for, for making your play more effective in XCOM 2. So that is the, let's go ahead and do the, do the specialist before I start on the hero classes. Um, for those of you who watched my very brief breakdown of a specialist in the second part of my guide slash let's play that I, I uploaded. Um, you will know that I don't really value the specialist. So I'm going to do my best here to kind of just go over the abilities for the specialist especially um, and just say what they do and how they could be used. And you can come to your own opinion about whether you should use a specialist or not. I personally don't think that they're all that useful, but again, that's just my opinion. Starting with the squatty abilities, every um, you get the ability the ability to give your guys plus twenty five defense with aid protocol, and the ability to hack uh, the little advent towers that are sometimes on some of the city maps, which can give you some bonuses and things like that. Um, this, I mean, because you get it for free, it isn't a horrible ability, but nine times out of ten, I feel like the reward isn't really worth it in those towers and the percentage to get something like let's say you can get a large supply of supplies or typically it's like a small supply of supplies large supply of supplies um the 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 ability to get the easier of the two is normally not going to be worth the chance of having let's say an enemy pod called in on you that's just making more work for yourself and especially in the early game when you're probably scrambling to get to an objective. Um, it's just not worth it in my opinion, a lot of the time. Um, so for the corporal and sergeant abilities, we have medical protocol and combat protocol. Now, both of these are actually kind of okay. Um, the really nice thing about medical protocol is it only costs one action. Very important thing to note because combat protocol costs two actions. Well, you, I mean, you can technically move and use this, so I guess it costs one action, but in terms of action economy, it costs two, uh, and you can go negative. But um, you can sign up a little gremlin, it'll do some damage. It deals two damage with the first gremlin. Uh, after you upgrade the gremlin, to be honest, I don't think I've ever used this ability pass just you know needing an extra two damage so i don't know what they do for gremlin level two or gremlin level three um oops uh this is just really nice if let's say you're on your very first gorilla op and you have two advent troopers and an, an advent officer pod and your grenadier hits two advent troopers and blows up the cover for the officer you can basically ensure that you're going to kill one of those advent troopers with combat protocol if you don't feel that your your specialist has the aim which of, oftentimes they don't have the aim to secure the kill on the advent trooper so pretty useful ability for that um, and then medical good safety blanket in case you take some damage um, the problem with this is a lot of the time i shouldn't say a lot of the time um your 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 guys when they get a promotion from squatty will have five health 
Advent Troopers will typically deal three to four damage, so yes, you can bring them back from the brink of death, but it doesn't it doesn't help you if you get a crit shot on you, which Advent Troopers will will typically try and flank you in order to get that crit, or go after targets who are out of cover. Um, if medical protocol was carried over into the after action report, you know, like into the main part of the game uh, to where, hey, I took damage during a mission, but I used medical protocol on my guy, and now he's not out for X number of days, I would probably say the specialist would be one of the best classes in the game, especially for the early game. But because it doesn't, again, it's a nice safety net, but if your goal is to kill all the advent troopers or the whole pod, on the first turn that you run into them, you shouldn't be taking that much damage to begin with, which is why I don't value medical protocol all that often. Um, however, revival protocol and haywire protocol are kind of a different story between these two. Um, I personally think that revival protocol is 10 times better than haywire protocol uh, for the simple fact that you're gonna run into the chosen at some point and the chosen are definitely going to disorient you at some point. Um, whether it's the assassin slashing one of your people and they get disoriented from that, uh, the hunter loves to grapple around over and over again and then throw, I think he throws the flashbang um, and disorients your guys and makes them unable to see, um, or even the warlock uh, disorienting your guys. Um, just using your revival, revival protocol gets rid of that, and you don't have to deal with the, the worst move speed and uh, aim penalty that your your guys suffer while under this effect, or those effects. Um, the problem with Haywire protocol is it's just very inconsistent. Um, a lot of the time, even when you have a Gremlin Mark III, um, and you're trying to hack and take over control of uh, a mech, Sure, it's nice to, to have that unit, but I could also just kill the unit. And then I wouldn't have to worry about it anymore. I, I, I don't know. I just, I don't feel that, like, the, the risk of, of giving an Advent Heavy Mech or a Sectopod or whatever, giving them additional defense and better aim is worth the, the risk of let's say a 50% chance to take them over, or even like the 75% chance it is to stun them on a sectopod, which in my experience is normally where these numbers lie. Let me know if you have different experiences with Hairwire protocol. Maybe I'm just wrong. Um, I, I just feel like revival protocol, I would get way more use out of, uh, out of this ability than I would with Haywire protocol on my, my specialist. Uh, moving into the final portion of the mid-game talents for the specialist we have field medic and scanning protocol uh, you get extra heals for your medical protocol with field medic S uh, short sweet simple good fallback net uh, scanning protocol I don't I don't think I have ever used scanning protocol or the little battle scanner that you can throw out I kind of think it's a useless talent or a useless ability Yes, it's good for things like chrysalids when they, they burrow, but a lot of the times they kind of just say, oh, hey, there was a chrysalid that that burrowed um, next to, and then insert landmark here. And I say, hey, if I get really close to this landmark, I probably should start just overwatch creeping and then move one single guy up, um, like a ranger with blade master or something like that. So that if the chrysalid comes out of burrow and he tries to attack me, I have, you know, five other people shooting at that that chrysalid and then i also have a ranger with blade master and then chrysalids aren't that scary or a lot of the time when you run into chrysalids and they're not on the the gatekeeper uh mission where you where you run into the the gatekeeper for the first time out of the giant warp gate a lot of the times they don't even burrow so you don't need scanning protocol um i just don't think that this talent is all that useful um you can use it to scout, I guess, but you probably should have a scout class for that. Um, and I, I think the specialist isn't particularly useful as a, as a scout class. Um, so moving into captain, um, we have covering fire and threat assessment. 
Um, again, kind of similar story to what we've had with a lot of these talents. One of these is clearly better than the other. Um, covering fire is nice in that if you're in Overwatch and an, an Advent Trooper stays in place because they don't want to trigger your Overwatch and they shoot in place, you'll actually shoot back at them with covering fire because them using the action, aka them shooting at your guys, will trigger the Overwatch. Um, However, I think threat assessment is just better because because aid protocol only costs one action, you can give a friendly guy overwatch essentially for free in a lot of cases. Um, you could move up uh, one of your other classes, use all their actions, and your specialist has a somewhat decent shot on, on an enemy you want to take. Just throw down an aid protocol on, on one of your friendly guys you want to give overwatch to and then take the shot. Um, you basically get two shots for the price of one, if that if that makes sense to you guys. Uh, but yeah, I, I quite like threat assessment. I think that it is a little bit less situational than cover and fire. So moving into the major and kernel talents, aka our late game talents for the specialist, um, we have ever ever vigilance and guardian. Um, both of these are somewhat okay. Um, the problem that I have with Ever Vigilant and why I don't particularly like it is that if I'm using all of my moves and then I move need to move into Overwatch, I probably can afford one more turn to move again and then Overwatch normally. Um, there are not a whole lot of situations that I think that you need to yellow move and then be able to Overwatch. Um, that just it just doesn't seem like this would provide a whole lot of utility, at least in my playthroughs, um, which makes Guardian the only other real choice. Uh, the problem with Guardian is, yeah, you have a 50% chance that you can take another shot, but you have to be in Overwatch to do it. So I guess you could use Medical Protocol to heal someone and then go into Overwatch, but why would I want to incur an overwatch penalty with a chance to take more shots when I could also just take a shot and hopefully secure a kill on that turn. That's generally my train of thought on uh, the shortcomings of Guardian. So then moving into Colonel, we have Restoration and Capacitor Discharge. Um, both of these are actually really powerful. Um, these are probably some of the best talents for the specialist, but unfortunately they're not good in they're not available until Colonel. Um, you can heal everyone in your team. That's really, really strong, especially if you're if you're in a less than advantageous situation. Um, and then Capacitor Discharge, you have a decent sized AOE that does a pretty good amount of damage to robotic enemies, but a pretty lackluster amount to organic enemies. Um, but being able to spread damage between a whole bunch of en enemies is what generally makes Capacitor Discharge sign, uh, shine. So, um, yeah, the fact that you can also com uh, combine this with, you know, an aid protocol with threat, threat assessment or medical protocol with a Capacitor Discharge, not bad. Uh, not not bad end game uses for the, the specialist. Um, Let's go ahead and talk about the hero classes. Oh, we'll have to go over to here to talk about the spark first. Um, oh shoot, I can't show you the... Hey, how to edit this because I thought... Oh, I thought... Oh, here we go. Move you out of the way so you can see this. Okay, so, spark. Um, Spark is a very interesting unit. Um, I see some people say it's only really good in the early game. It kind of falls off in the mid game. I actually usually have quite a bit of fun using it later on in the game. Um, adaptive aim versus bulwark. These are both... <sighs> adaptive aim is going to be almost always better than bulwark, even though bulwark can be situationally pretty good. Um, so you get bonus armor, which is good. Um, just 
you're getting uh, more tankiness on a pretty tanky class. The easy, the tankiest class is pretty good, um, and it gives high cover if you're up against your your spark, which is good. Um, however, adaptive aim, the fact that if you overdrive, you get to not incur an aim penalty is also really strong. The, the one reason that I say both of these are probably, they're, they're comparable, is that Bulwark is always going to be active. Adaptive aim is not always going to be active. Um, early on, especially when you're doing the, those early game missions, when you need to get to objectives that need to be hacked, if you need to destroy the object, um, if you need to, um, I guess, defend the objective, but normally, especially early game, you can take your time on those, but you can't really just sit and wait for your over, uh, overdrive to come off cooldown on your sparks uh, like you can sometimes in, in the later game so that you have uh, adaptive aim readily available. Um, I personally just like not having to, to deal with the aim penalty. A lot of the times when I do use uh, overdrive, I try and take three shots or two shots. Um, however, if you, if you have that aim penalty, it almost sometimes feels like, yeah, I can take the first shot, but the, the, the two following shots are going to be at such a, a disadvantage that there's almost no point in, in, in using it. Um, it says a small recoil penalty, but it's it's minus 15 per shot um, after you use overdrive if you don't have adaptive aim, which is pretty huge. Um, so let's say you had a, an enemy that had a 90% chance to hit, all of a sudden that will drop to 75% chance to hit on the next one, and then 50% chance to hit on the last one, which is pretty significant. Um, so let's go into Knight, which is the, uh, the, the last part of our early game abilities for our spark here. Um, strike or Rainmaker? Um, strike is good in that it gives you a melee ability with a really tanky class. However, Rainmaker to me is just... You get a lot more use out of it, especially after you get something like a Shredder Cannon. That's generally my experience with it. Um, the problem with Strike for me is that it's not until later on in the tech tree that you can really dive deep into the quote-unquote melee side of Sparks. Um, or I, I guess you could say the close quarter side of Sparks. Um, and even so, a lot of the time you don't want to be moving very aggressively with a target that one, can't get into cover, and two, um, the, the abilities that would quote-unquote pair with, with Strike just aren't they, they aren't that useful, uh, unfortunately. So that to me only really leaves Rainmaker. Um, let's say I have three enemies or four enemies if it's a later game pod lined up in a row. If I can take a Shredder Cannon from dealing seven to eight damage to, you know, 10 damage, that's 40 damage in total that I'm dealing to a, a group of enemies, which is a pretty significant swing in damage, in my opinion. Um, so Cavalier for the mid-game abilities for Spark. Um, both of these are kind of mediocre. I, I think I probably shouldn't have taken Intimidate. I Wrecking Ball is okay in that there are some times when you know you're not going to be able to shoot all three times with your overdrive and you need to move. Wrecking Ball can create a, a and an ability to one, give your regular troops better sight lines by breaking through cover or a building or even just getting into an objective easier um, it's very useful for them but that that's all that it's really good for and even so like what if you don't need to use wrecking ball for that use or even worse, you misclick and all of a sudden the cover that your guy was using is gone because your spark accidentally just blew up his cover, basically. Um, Intimidate isn't that much better, though, because I I can't remember the last time I ever saw Intimidate proc. Um, you have to, one, be attacked by an enemy. 
simple enough because your spark is never going to be in cover so it feels like the uh, advent prior to prioritize shooting at the spark just because he's not in cover but I just I feel like this doesn't proc enough to make it very useful uh, so that brings us into a vanguard tree with bombard and repair the only real choice to me is bombard unless you're going for like a mass meme spark rush where you have a whole bunch of sparks excuse me um yeah then repair is never going to be useful unless you're fielding two sparks at the, or or more at a time um and bombard is just basically another aoe that you get other than the rocket launcher or the shredder cannon or whatever um yeah, Bombard is just really, really useful. Um, something important to note about Bombard, though. When you place it over an enemy, uh, and that enemy is behind cover, it will not show that it will destroy the cover the enemy is behind, but it will destroy cover. Um, just in case you're, you're newer to using sparks and you, you wanted to try out Bombard, it, you can destroy cover with Bombard. It won't show that it will, but it, trust me, it will. Um, so finally, that brings us into our late game abilities with Paladin. Um, I was actually pleasantly surprised with Hunter Protocol. Hunter Protocol basically means anytime you activate an enemy pod, there's a 33% chance you get an Overwatch shot for free. You don't have to enter in Overwatch. It can still be the middle of your turn. You can still get a chance to uh, take an Overwatch shot. And for me, sometimes it feels like it's more than a 33% chance. Um, sometimes it felt like it was more like a 50% chance. But the way you should think of it is, pods are usually, at least up until the very late game, going to be in three-person three, three person units. That means every time you activate a, a pod, statistically you are probably going to take an Overwatch shot for free. Um, that that is a really strong ability in my opinion uh channeling field on the other hand um because it requires you to be targeted and i know i was saying with intimidate more than likely your spark is going to be targeted um you basically just get more damage in a standard shot every time you're targeted but again if you're playing xcom 2 efficiently you're taking as few actions from advent as possible so channeling field can be really good but in my experience it's just kind of a waste of talent that you might every once in a while get some bonus damage off um, but I'd rather have something that's a little bit more reliable um, and even though it's a 30% chance to take a shot that in all honesty feels better than channeling field at least to me um, so finally we get to the champion which is the last tier for spark um both of these are actually pretty darn good um nova i probably again should have gone with the other one and taken sacrifice um basically gives everyone in a, a field around your spark plus 25 defense it's basically aid protocol on steroids um and then Nova, you get a... It's kind of a small AoE. It's not a huge AoE. Um, but as I was mentioning earlier with Strike, this this does pair, quote-unquote, well in a close combat sort of role um, with, with Strike here in that you can deal a whole bunch of damage to enemy units. It does increase damage to mechanical units. Um... The, the problem is, and it says there in the text down there, if you use it too much, it will deal damage to your spark, which obviously you don't want. Uh, sacrifice is just really, really good for giving your guys extra uh, defense if needed. Um, and it, it feels like, although you are going to be required to not kill Advent on the first turn that you meet them in order to use it, um, just if the AOE on Nova was a little bit larger, I would I would highly recommend taking Nova over Sacrifice. But the the sphere that they give you for no, uh, Nova is so small that I can only name a couple of a couple of instances where I felt like it was really beneficial to have Nova rather rather than Sacrifice. Um, with that being said, let's go ahead and hop back up to the Reaper go back down here into the training center because this just gives us a little bit cleaner view. 
of their talents. Um, so yeah, Reapers. Uh, Reapers are really strong, really, really good scouting unit. Um, and that is, first and foremost, the way that I play with my Reapers. I use them as a scouter, first and foremost, and a damage dealer, second. Um, we'll get into that in a little bit here, why I preference that, but that may influence the way that you want to pick up some of these talents when we when we get to them. Um, so Shadow, basically just a better version of Concealment. You have to basically touch Advent in order for them to, to see you. And a Claymore, it's like a really, really strong grenade, basically. Um, with uh, the Grenadier's grenade radius, but with more damage. So, moving into Corporal and Sergeant for the early game. Um, remote start. Really, really strong ability. Um, you, again, kind of get that grenadier size um, explosion, and it does 12 damage, which will pretty much kill everything early game that you're going to run into, um, especially stun lancers. Stun lancers terrify me early game, so having this to deal with them is, is pretty darn good. Um, Blood Trail, plus one damage to targets that have been wounded this turn. Now, this kind of goes back to what I was saying about the Reaper in that I value the Reaper as a scout first and a damage dealer second. Um, because Remote Start does not reveal the Reaper from Shadow and the Blood Trail has a chance of revealing them from uh, from Shadow, I don't personally like Blood Trail all that often. And that's for a couple of reasons. One, it requires you to, to face that possibility of getting revealed, as I mentioned. But two, you have to, one, wound an enemy. So, like, let's say, uh, just for a high health target, let's say it's a sectoid, which has 10 health early game in, iron, uh, in Legendary. And let's say it takes three damage from a grenade, because you're blowing up the cover from the sectoid. Blood Trail is not going to give you enough damage to kill that sectoid, because the the uh, the Reaper's rifle only deals three to four damage, so that gives you at most five damage unless you get a crit in order to deal seven damage on that sectoid. Um, but even if you say shot that sec that same sectoid with um, let's say a crit from a ranger and you did uh, a ranger shotgun and you did six or seven damage let's just say seven damage to be on the high side um you already can kill it in one shot without blood trail and if you did six damage on the low side for that for that ranger with his shotgun you could roll a four and kill that enemy but if you want to have that guarantee to kill the enemy you could take blood trail so that's the only real situation especially in early game that blood trail really comes in because other than that you have the advent officers which again, you could, you could say, hey, you know, I, I blew up the the cover from an Advent officer with a grenadier grenade. I did three damage, and now he has um, because officers have seven health in the early game. Now he has four health remaining. This will guarantee that I, I get the kill. Um, more often than not, you could just roll a four, or if you're placing your Reaper effectively, you're gonna be taking a flanking shot on him anyway because he's standing out of cover because you destroyed the cover that he was standing behind. Um, I just don't think that Blood Trail gives you enough utility. It can be useful later on with some of the uh, other abilities that we'll get into here, but first and foremost, the ability to uh, remove yourself from Shadow in order to deal one extra damage just is not worth it to me. Um, this, while situational, because they have to be around an explosive object, just does such damage, and if you... If you, I don't want to say kite advent, but if you kind of force them into the area that has a car or some gas tanks or whatever, something that you can blow up, and you can do that if you're smart about your soldier placement, this this isn't as unreliable as it sometimes can be made out to be. Uh, target definition and shrapnel for our sergeant ranks, which is are the last two abilities for the early game Reaper. Um, target definition permanently reveals um, invisible enemies or just enemies that you you've seen so let's say you see a pod of enemies and um, 
they walk away from your reaper outside of your normal line of sight, you'll still have vision on, on them. Or uh, the assassin goes invisible, you'll still have vision of the assassin. This to me is just kind of a, I don't have the, I don't have the, the game knowledge or I don't want to say the, the technical skills, but you don't need this. I, I think this is probably one of the worst abilities in the game. It just feels really useless to me, even probably more so than the one that requires you to hunker down. Like, I guess there's a freak incident that you would want to hunker down for extra aim on your sniper. Um, I just, I don't see this being all that useful. Um, there is something, I guess, to be said for finding the assassin, but normally I don't have all that much trouble finding the assassin. Um, or I just let her come to me and then I kill her basically instantly with whatever uh, hero um, is, 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 is targeting her or she's weak against. Um, which leads me into Shrapnel, which I think is a fantastic ability because it takes... Um, an already really strong grenade and makes it even stronger and you can get two of them later on and you stay invisible while you, you throw these these grenades so um, really really strong ability I, I personally recommend it more than target definition but again that's just my, my opinion so moving into lieutenant and captain for our mid game abilities we have silent killer um, the text on this is kind of it's misleading. Uh, basically, silent killer should just mean if you kill an enemy while you're in shadow with your with your sniper rifle, you don't get revealed. Um, because I don't know why I say why it says the chance to reveal still occurs. Um, because it would make you think that there's still a chance for you to get revealed. But when it shows up at the top, it still says zero. So I think it was just kind of they couldn't code past that little bar popping up at the top. So they said, well, it's going to pop up anyway. So let's just say it. there's a chance to reveal. Um, so for you people who want to use the Ranger as a damage dealer, this is this is the way to do it. If you want to combo um, Silent Killer with Blood Trail, I, I think this is a worthwhile uh, pickup. It's worthwhile in general because it takes the Reaper from being a scout that just throws grenades like crazy um, into a scout that throws grenades while crazy that can also shoot damaged enemies and kill those enemies without getting revealed. Um, distraction. The problem with distraction is I don't know why you would ever want to have your your Reaper get revealed and then throw a Claymore. Um, the great thing about Claymores is you can run up to an enemy pod before you're revealed and then throw the claymore down so you hit all the targets in the pod. That's what makes claymores really, really good. And what makes the reaper really, really good in my opinion. Um, I can see some instances of, hey, I, I started with blood trail. I want my reaper to be a damage dealer. Um, I, yeah, I mean, just kind of theory crafting the reason that you would you would take distraction. It's kind of a mystery to me. I I, I don't I don't feel that it's all that useful but um let me know what you think below if you think distraction can be uh, a really useful talent let me know some instances that you have gotten some use out of it or how often you get use out of it um so needle is the the last uh talent in our tenantry is this the first class that has uh yeah yeah this is the first class that has three different talent trees um yeah so we have needles plus two armor piercing. So you ignore two, two armor on an enemy. This is, again, really strong ability if you want to combo it with things like Blood Trail, things like Silent Killer. Um, highly, highly recommend Needle. Not a must take. Normally I'll take Silent Killer just because, again, I want to be able to run around, throw grenades, and shoot. Um, but yeah, good, good, good talent. Um, Captain. We have Sting, and we have Soul Harvest. Um, so because of how valuable I find Silent Killer, the ability to farm kill shots, which increases your crit chance, um, I think is the, is the clear choice to me because I am going to only be taking kill shots when I'm shooting because of Silent Killer. Um, the problem with Sting is that 
yeah, you can use Sting on a target that you can't kill, and you don't face that that chance of being revealed, but how how often is that going to make a, a noticeable difference? Like, let's say you can't kill all the enemies in a pod. Um, you killed two of the three, and you're kind of down bad, and... I, I guess maybe you could t use Sting and say, hey, if I get this crit on this um, on this Advent Trooper and I need to roll a four instead of a three with the, with the base sniper rifle, just for comparison. Um, I, I guess you could make the Sting as a good way of ensuring that you don't get revealed, but even if you do get revealed, you still can go back into Shadow again once per per run per mission um and that would alleviate some of the pressure off your team um but you could also just do something else with your reaper like hey we're not going to be able to kill this this last enemy i'm going to go fix pod and make sure that that i'm in a good position to start figuring out how we need to approach the objective after we kill this one advent trooper um by using a whole bunch of actions next turn, we're going to be a little bit less efficient in the way that we move towards the objective. Or if it is the last pod, well then it probably doesn't matter if I get revealed or not, um, because it's just the one enemy left. Um, yeah, I, I I don't find Sting to be all that useful when Silent Killer is, is a talent and it's available sooner. Um, so moving into Major and Colonel, we have Highlands, which gives you an additional Claymore, short, sweet, and simple. Um, really useful talent. And then you have Banish. Um, so Banish, I really useful for dealing out damage. However, the way that I actually play my Reaper, if I uh, go to my Reaper here, this is the, the typical... Um, attachments that I put on the Reaper's um, gun. I'll usually have a superior um, magazine upgraded and then a superior repeated. Uh, now, unfortunately for this playthrough, I only have an advanced expanded magazine at this point, but um, you can theory craft along with me. Um, you'll, you'll probably guess why I like Banish so much. I take my five, in this case, or six shots, with a 15% chance on each of those shots if they hit to kill an enemy instantly. That is a really strong ability, especially against things like the Chosen or um, the Alien Rulers or a Sectopod. Um, six, six shots at a 15% chance for each of those shots to, to kill them instantly. It's not going to be a guaranteed 100% chance at the time because uh, that's just not how statistics work. Um, but you will definitely have a considerably higher chance of one-shotting that enemy um, if all of those shots hit. So I really like Banish a lot for that for that use. It is kind of a niche, um, hey, I'm saving this for a really scary enemy sort of pick, but um, I like it quite a bit. Uh, and then Highlands is also just really good because you get an additional Claymore. I normally pick both of these. Uh, you can kind of decide which you prefer. For me, I normally pick Highlands first just because Banish is very situational um, for dealing that massive amount of damage or just kind of going for that cheesy strap that I was talking about. But uh, That's up for you to decide. Uh, and then we have Annihilate and Homing Mind. These are kind of two really mediocre abilities in my opinion. Um, we'll start with Annihilate just because we, we just talked about Banish. So when you kill a target with Banish, you you continue, continue firing uh, until you run out of ammo. The problem with Annihilate is, one, you can't choose the enemy that you shoot at next. And two, a lot of the times with Banish, you're going to be using it on targets that have so much health that you're going to run out of ammo before you kill them anyway. Now, with that cheesy sort of strat where I'm using the repeater and the extend, extended magazine, let's say I kill the Chosen on my fourth shot uh, with the repeater. And then I have two others to shoot. Well, if I can't choose the target that I'm shooting at, what if the target's in heavy cover? Or what if the target's in like a really disadvantageous position for me to be shooting at? Or what if there is no other target? Um, in that case, I would rather take something like homing mine. 
Now, the thing about homing mine is, no, it doesn't give you any more mines. Um, and it only will explode on an enemy taking damage. But the one thing that it doesn't show here in homing mine is, um, as long as you have line of sight on the enemy, you can attach a homing mine to them. It's not like throwing a regular claymore where you have to be within a certain distance for the spear, the AOE, to fall over an, en an enemy. Um, you can just throw it onto the enemy uh, if they're half the map away. As long as you have line of sight on them, it'll attach. So that's why I think homing mine is a slight better than annihilate. Just my opinion. Um, yeah, let me know what you guys think uh, in the comments down below. Uh, we're down to the last two classes. I know this has been very long so far, um, but we're almost there. So Templar, um, Rend. Basically, you just use the little gauntlet that he has for a melee attack bolt. Um, you use focus. You can shoot out a lightning bolt. Um, I want to say it's at... Yeah, it's at two focus. Duh. Because um, that's what he starts with. Um, it'll jump to a, a, another enemy um, with, with bolt. And then you have sage. Basically, just means that um, you can use your focus abilities. Moving into the early game towns for Corporal and Sergeant, we have Parry, we have Aftershock, and we have Amplify. Now, Parry to me is just one of the best abilities of the game. It's basically um, the untouchable talent for Rangers that's available to you at Corporal. You just have to kill an enemy. You don't even have to kill an enemy. You just have to use Rend, and you get to uh, ignore one tick of damage that sends your way. Incredibly, incredibly strong ability. I honestly wouldn't even consider either of these just because of how good parry is but for the sake of uh being as thorough with this as, as we can um for aftershock um it basically just applies hollow targeting onto uh, an enemy that you use volt the problem with using volt in my opinion is i i like using templars as a melee class and i know that some people will say that's not the proper way to play templar uh templar because you can trigger more pod that if you're not careful with your your placement your placement but because as i've mentioned previously i really value the the ability to scout especially on legendary difficulty that i will almost always have one scout unit i don't oftentimes find myself in a spot where I absolutely have to reveal an enemy pod if I use Ren. A lot of the times I feel like I can use building to shield my movement or even just uh, making um, moves around an enemy. Like let's say um, an enemy is up here and there's a pod over here somewhere and I have a building right here and my Templar is over here I'd run around the back of the building with my blue move and then yellow move up to the enemy if that makes sense just kind of taking an extra extra step to make sure that I don't trigger extra pods with my with my melee can't always do that and yes you will sometimes mess up and trigger more pods but the more that you play this game the more that using uh, Rend at least in my opinion becomes the Templar's best best way of, of dealing damage and not so much through bolt um amplify uh basically just means that you get to deal more damage uh to an enemy this is another really strong ability um again it costs focus though and i like being able to deal more damage with with rend by having focus because that's the way that the damage scales with, with rend the more focus you have the more damage you deal um there's nothing wrong with taking amplify though this is a really strong ability um, especially if you want to deal more damage to targets early game, like the Advent ger Generals, uh, Advent Officers, Sectoids, things like that. Um, overcharge for our Sergeant tier list. Um, this feels somewhat inconsistent to me. There, There's something to be said for taking it. I just, I, I don't feel like... Um, if I, if I rend an enemy, I want to be able to get focused because normally if I'm using rend, I'm going to kill an enemy anyway because I'm moving my Templar up into melee range. Um, there is that... Uh, I wouldn't... I would, 
uh, unlikely chance that I chance that I, I rend an enemy that I can't kill because that's one of the things that parry is very useful for is say you fight in an, an Andromedon or something like that or a really scary unit and you can't kill it um, you just run up and rend it and then use parry and then the Andromedon is going to say oh there's a guy right in front of me I'm going to punch him and you ignore the damage and that's all that the Andromedon can do things like that sure there's a reason to have overcharge but I find a majority of the time if I'm using my Templar I'm, I'm gaining uh, focus naturally just by killing units anyway um, moving into pillar I don't value this very much as I'm sure you've kind of guessed I like to hold on to my focus as much as possible using it for cover uh, there's so much cover in all, all of I want to say 90% of the, the maps that we, you'll be given there's just so much cover there is the odd map every once in a while where you feel like you're just running through an open field uh, and you'd have to yell a move to get up into cover but that can also come down to the way that you're you're playing the map uh, parking lots especially in some of the maps uh, it can feel that way but um, moving into sunstrike the thing that i like about sunstrike is you can knock an enemy out of cover so if you have a gren grenadier that's tied up or he already used his turn to blow cover up somewhere else and you need to remove a single target from from cover uh, you just use sunstrike and sure it's only got a 70 percent chance most of the time to hit but um, if it does hit, normally it means that one of your other other units can clean up that enemy and, uh, and kill them um, by just hitting them while they're out of cover and getting a crit. Moving into Lieutenant for our final um, mid-tier talents for our Templar. We have Deflect. Um, Deflect is really strong. As long as you have... Uh, as long as you have focus, you can deflect shots, which pairs very nicely with parry. And then channel. Um, I I would probably say channel is better than deflect in that you don't have to kill an enemy to get focus. And this is very dependent on you taking damage. Be but because of how aggressive that I play, I normally get my Templar into somewhat bad situations um i shouldn't say somewhat bad situations but situations that are less than ideal um in which having deflect can be a really useful option um and yeah um moving on to captain we have reflect invert and deep focus let's start with deep focus because i i chose that this time um i just like having extra focus to play along with kind of the theme of the templar in my in my playthroughs um Increasing the uh, the max amount to three means you also deal more damage with Rend, which I think is very useful for the way that I play Templar. Uh, invert. This is a very useful tool um, in that typically my guys tend to be very clumped together. All of my units tend to be very clumped together. So if I can invert a very scary uh, Advent Trooper or Officer or whatever that I'm not sure I can kill, but I want to make make sure that I can kill, or like a Muton that's in heavy cover or something like that. Um, it, it virtually guarantees that I'm going to be able to cl uh, flank that enemy from my firing line, my, my, my fire team's position, if that makes sense. Um, and another, another nice thing about Invert is it costs one action. Yes, it costs one focus, but it also costs one action. So you can immediately rend uh, since you're going to be right next to that target that you switched places with, you're going to be right next to all of his allies. So you should be able to get a rend off as well, and then parry. Um, the only problem with invert is if you're not scouting effectively, sometimes you can trigger more pods, and that just leads to more issues. And then you have reflect. Um, basically just means that you can shoot a shot back at an uh, attacker, which is a better version of deflect. Um, I, I I just like having the extra safety blanket of having deflect on top of parry. Um, <coughs> the fact that you can shoot this back at someone makes it be better um, in this particular playthrough. I just I, I really and truly probably should have gone with channel instead of deflect, and then maybe I would have taken reflect. But I just like having deep focus. So these are all really up to you. They're all I think very useful skills, but 
It just depends on your play style. Um, moving into Major and Colonel for our late game abilities for the Templar, we have Arc Wave. Generates a psionic wave in uh, basically a cone like you get with the Shredder Cannons and things like that. Um, the more focus you get, which pairs nicely with Deep Focus here, the more damage the, the wave will do. It's really useful for like Archons and things like that. They tend to clump together fairly regularly um, outside of cover. And then you have Exchange, where you can exchange a spot with a, with a squad mate. Um, I can't think of a reason I would ever use this. Um, if you're smart with your, your guy's placement, more than likely you don't really need to do this. Um, I guess if one of your backliners, um, like say a sharpshooter or a... Uh, I guess even a Grenadier is, is out of position and they're getting flanked by like a melee unit and you want to get them out of out of harm's way. But if you're playing with your Templar, I mean, Templar is a frontline unit. Like, why would you want to put one of your backline units up put a front line? It just, uh, this, uh, this ability doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me as to why you would take it. Um, so I, I pretty much just say take Arc Wave always over Exchange too situational um in my opinion and then finally uh colonel for incredibly incredibly strong abilities in ionic storm void conduit and ghost starting out with uh ionic storm basically you uh you just use all your focus that you have and you drop a lightning storm on people really really strong ability important thing to note um your ghost that you summon has all the abilities that you have um, including Ionic Storm. <clears throat> I don't know if people um, still are under this assumption, but I saw a while back someone said that um, Ghosts only had and and and, pre and previous abilities, and it wouldn't have things like this. But no, uh, Ghost Ghost will definitely have Ionic Storm if you, if you take it. Um, so going into the Ghost real quick. Um, since we, we, we mentioned that. Basically, you just pick up a, a humanoid body, you know, an advent trooper, officer, civilian, whatever. Um, you summon a, basically a, a, a copy of yourself, has all your abilities, including any of these abilities. So like for this playthrough, my ghost had Reaper and things like that. But again, since we're not counting these, it'll have arc wave, deep focus, deflect, which means this ghost has three focus. Um, <clears throat> Your, uh, your ghost can use all these abilities and it, and it will disappear when it uses up all the focus. So what I typically like to do with my ghost is use it as an ionic storm carrier. Um, basically create the ghost, run it in with three focus because I have deep focus. Use ionic storm, which will do a, a deal a ton of damage to a an okay size AoE. Um, and then I can also use my Templar, which will have one focus uh, remaining to still dish out some damage with volts if I need to, or just gain more focus with rain, Ren, things like that. Um, void Conduit, um, it's kind of like status that the uh, priests and the... Um, um, oh gosh, your psyops guys get, um, but you get to, uh, to steal health from them. Speaking of psyops, I haven't talked about them yet. I probably should do that. Um, and this only costs one focus. Really, really strong ability. I just think these two are that much better. Um, crowd control is really, really good. Um, being able to take out a high health humanoid, humanoid enemy that you can't deal with is, is pretty useful, um, especially for things like shield bearers later on because they have anywhere from three to four armor and they can kind of be hard to take down on, on legendary difficulty. Um, making sure that they can't give armor to everyone uh, is pretty, pretty useful. Um, but that is the, <clears throat> excuse me, that is the Templar. Let's talk about the skirmisher and then we'll go into the psyops. Um, so for the skirmisher, we have these squatty abilities of uh, grapple, justice, and marauder. Basically, marauder means that you can shoot for one action instead of two, which it is for every other class in the game. 
Camp Justice, which allows you to Indiana Jones someone over to you uh, and then hit them with your Ripjack, which is your little melee. Uh, deals four damage at, at base. And then you have grapple. You get to grapple hook your, your way up. Um, free action. Very, very important thing to note about grapple, especially in War of the Chosen when we get to things like uh, the alien rulers and things like that. Um, so starting off with Corporal and Sergeant, we have a reflex total combat. Um, both of these are kind of situational. Um, you get an extra action on the next turn it, when you get shot at, but this only happens once per mission, which makes reflex... <coughs> excuse me again. Um, in my opinion, not as good as total combat. Um, sometimes what I'll do is... Uh, I'll, I'll, if I can't grapple somewhere, I'll just throw a grenade and I'll shoot someone. And that makes total combat, I think, a little bit more useful um, than, than reflex. Or just throw a mimic beacon on my uh, skirmishers. That way they can be the, the dedicated throwing class and they can still deal damage while doing that. Um, Sergeant, we have Wrath and Zero in. Uh, so Wrath allows you to pull yourself with justice, the, the same ability, to an enemy, and then deal that um, that ripjack damage that we were talking about earlier. Um, this costs one action, so you can pull yourself to an enemy, and then you'll probably have a 100% chance to, to hit. Um, the only problem is, a lot of the time, I'm using grapple pretty rarely on my on my skirmishers to get them into uh, an advantageous position to where I like zero in in that I usually have a high enough percent chance to hit that um, I, I can probably just take two shots in order to kill like an admin officer um, with that three uh, three uh, to four damage with the, the bullpup um, in one turn. Plus the the additional critical hit chance is uh, is, is pretty nice for uh, for zero in. We have whiplash, we have full throttle, and uh, almost a saturation fire, but that's that's not included in this. Um, full throttle, um, extra mobility for each turn. Yeah, it's a good ability in that. Uh, for each kill that you get, you can move farther throughout the rest of throughout the rest of the mission. However, a lot of the time, if you if you're getting all these kills on your skirmisher, well, one, you probably aren't going to get all the kills on your skirmisher. But two, you you don't want to go too far away from the rest of your squad. Otherwise, you'll probably trigger you know the last pod uh, after you've killed you know three or four enemies right um and you'll be out there by yourself that compared to whiplash which is one a free action doesn't cost cost an action and it does additional damage to mechanized units which is really useful um i just think whiplash whip, bleh, excuse me whiplash is better it allows you to attack three three times on your turn if you want to really really powerful ability um Moving into Captain, we have Combat Presence, we have Retribution, and we have Interrupt. Um, let's start with Combat Presence. Um, basically, you just get to give anyone an extra action. This is really, really strong. Um, you can combo it with so many different classes in so many different ways. I personally always, always, always take Combat Presence. I think it's one of the more useful abilities of the Skirmisher. It does mean that you can only shoot once, but um, a lot of the times you're giving it an action to a class that can do something a little bit more efficient than you. Um, the, the one major shortcoming of the Skirmisher is the Bullpup in that it deals less damage than the uh, weapons in the game. Excuse me. Um, we have Retribution as our, our second ability. Uh, basically Blade Storm for the Ranger. Um, basically copy and paste everything I said about Blade Storm from the Ranger into uh, Retribution. Um, very niche, somewhat useful ability. Uh, and then we have Interrupt. Um, 
I don't really care for interrupts because why, if I'm taking an overshot, would I want to do anything other than take a shot, really? Um, yeah, I think that's all I really need to say about that. I can't... I think, I guess there's something to be said that you could justice instead of shoot, but because typically justice, if you're especially in an elevated position, has a higher percent chance to hit, but nine times out of ten I'm just going to want to shoot anyway, so I think this is kind of a, a mute um, ability. Um, moving into Major and Colonel for our late, late game skirmisher abilities. We have Waylay. Um, so again, the, the problem with with waylay as, as it is with interrupt is you're entering overwatch um this one has a little bit more utility in that if you didn't move and you're entering overwatch you can shoot twice um again the problem with this is how often is this going to be useful to take two shots instead of one overwatch what you want to do is do as little as possible um on legendary you don't want to go into overwatch all that often unless you're doing overwatch creep um when i can also just take something like reckoning um which combos pretty nicely with, with wrath um combos nicely with justice um i can also use reckoning to essentially use a sword slash on my skirmisher so if i want to yellow move up to a target and still deal damage i can i can do that and if i have retribution if i don't kill that target i'll have a chance to hopefully kill them on on their turn when they when they take an action so um that's kind of where i stand on the major abilities let's move into the kernel abilities we have manual overdrive battle lord and judgment um manual overdrive Lower the uh, ability cooldowns by one. This is probably better than Battle Lord. I just took Battle Lord because I wanted to try it. Because just reading it, I didn't think it would be all that useful. And sure enough, it really wasn't all that useful. Um, the problem with Battle Lord is <sighs> it's kind of like a worse Overwatch in that. Let's say you go into a room, and for whatever reason, after you trigger a pod, you can't kill any of the enemies, so you enter in Battle Lord, and there, it's a three-person pod. After a unit makes its, uh, it makes its turn, you can take an action. So it's not like Overwatch, where the, the unit is going to run out of the cover, so it won't have that cover bonus. And sure, you're taking a negative uh, aim penalty, but they're out of cover, which kind of offsets that. Um, more than likely, the the trooper is going to, or whatever, is going to run into cover. It's going to shoot at you, um, and then it's going to end its turn. And then you get to use Battle Lord, which isn't all that great. Um, judgment, it, again, it requires you to be attacked, and it's fairly inconsistent. I, I don't value this very, very highly. Um, and manual override, it just, in my opinion, it gives me the ability to grapple more often and use a free action more often. Um, so I, if you're picking between these two, um, if you find yourself dealing with, you know, multiple enemies being able to take a turn, I would take Battle Lord over manual overdrive, but I, I feel like manual overdrive will keep you from having the enemies having, uh, um, two or three troops up on their turn because you'll have more actions available to you to use to kill them um let... hi everyone uh notice i had been recording for about an hour and 45 minutes and decided to take a little bit of break uh come back we'll, we'll finish up the uh the classes overview here with the psyops and then move into our tier list um, so starting off with the PsyOps, first important thing to note, all of the abilities that we're about to go uh, through here, you can unlock these at any time just because of the way that you train your PsyOps. So it's not like you have to start with Insanity or Inspire. You can go all the way and start with Void Rift. It's very RNG dependent um, on the abilities that you research. But just to give you a general overview, um, because you can get all of these 
and you don't have to give up one or the other. I'm, I'm basically just going to uh, go into detail about the abilities. There are a couple things that are unlisted and a few of these abilities that are worth mentioning. Um, and I won't say, I won't really give my opinion on how useful they are, um, more so because you can have all of these without giving anything else up. To start us off, we'll start with Insanity. Um, insanity is a really useful ability. Uh, does a little bit of damage with, uh, I believe it's Schism. Yep, so yes. Uh, well, we'll get to that here in a minute. Um, basically, Insanity by itself um, allows you a chance to mind control a target along with give them some, some debuffs, which if you can't kill an enemy, giving them debuffs and the chance to mind control them is pretty useful. Um, partnered with Inspire up here in the Acolyte tier, uh, we have the ability to basically give a free action to uh, anyone in your in your team. Moving on to Soul Steel, um, the Soul Fire ability will now uh, give some damage or give some health back to to your unit which is again really really useful soul fire is the the ability that all psyops have um even with the uh alien uh amplifier i can't remember the exact damage of soul fire it doesn't do a ton of damage but the fact that you get half of that damage back can be pretty useful um, just in case your Psyop takes a little bit of damage. Moving into the Stasis uh, Shield, um, the text here is a little misleading. You can Stasis an ally who's perhaps out of cover somewhere or in a bad situation where you don't want them to get attacked, but you can also use this on enemies. I don't know why that's only, it, it says you can only use it on allies, but you can in fact use it on, on enemies in the same way that the, uh, the Priest does for Advent. Moving into Sustain, Again, similar to the Priest ability, uh, it keeps your Psyops alive if they drop down to one health. Solstice, or Solus, excuse me, um, basically gives you um, a block for impairments from Sectoids, though the Warlock. Um, any Psy abilities that are used on your troops, as long as they're within a certain AoE from your uh, Psyops unit, won't be affected by things like panic and, and things like that. Uh, Schism, we talked on this very briefly with Insanity. It does a little bit of damage, not a ton, but um, the, the main draw of Schism is the fact that it applies Rupture to an enemy target, which is very, very powerful. Um, Fortress, Fortress is really useful in that, it uh, mostly for the explosive damage. Um, immunity. Um, if you run into like an advent mech that shoots some mortar at you or something like that and your units are all clumped up, well you don't have to worry about your your psyops taking taking damage. Um, moving into fuse, uh, if an enemy has a grenade or with the mech units if it has a mortar launcher you can blow up that target, does a little bit of AoE, um, also gets rid of the explosive that unit is carrying. And then you have domination, uh, basically mind control, very powerful ability. Moving into Void Rift, we have a fairly substantial size AoE that can um, also apply Insanity along with Schism, bo uh, buffing Insanity um, onto a large number of, of enemies. Um, I find that Void Rift, the, the chance to proc Insanity with, with Void Rift isn't super high so don't rely on insanity damage um like let's say you need to do 10 damage to an enemy and void rift by itself will do seven to eight and you, you you're banking on that little bit of extra damage from insanity it, it feels like it doesn't happen often enough for you to to use it to um reliably burst down high health enemies and then you have no lance uh very similar to the shredder cannon um, big long cone uh, does a decent amount of damage to enemy targets and the damage is really good on it. Uh, so even if you can only get two, three enemies, um, you're probably going to be dealing anywhere from 16 to 20 damage on two targets and if there's three targets there it's even better. So lots of, uh, lots of enemies can be uh, affected by no lance, good amount of damage. 
Um, and that's essentially it for the PSYOP. So let's go ahead and jump into the tier lists here. Um, you'll have to excuse the fact that some of these are a little bit different in size here. I couldn't exactly find the best, um, the best markers for the hero classes here. And the, the spark I had to take out of the game because for whatever reason, no one seems to have this listed on any of... Uh, the XCOM websites, but as I mentioned before, I want to do an early game, a mid game, and a late game tier list. So please remember the first two abilities for each class will be considered early game just for the sake of one, fairness, and two, uh, just so that assuming that, that all of your units are around the same level, if, if you have to make a choice between one or the other classes, um, this is how I personally would, would rank them if you uh, if you want to think of it that way. So I'm going to go ahead and start with the Ranger for early game. I'm going to move that up into S tier. Um, for those of you who watched my very brief review of classes in the second episode of the guide series that I have been working on, um, you'll know that the Ranger and the Grenadier, I said, are probably, they're very highly rated. Um, for all points in the game, and I'll probably do the Grenadier next because of that. But um, speaking about the Ranger, you have um, Bladestorm, very, very useful ability, allows you to one-shot a lot of the early game units that you run across. Um, the ability to ignore Overwatch, which can be very useful against mech enemies. Um, but even discounting their abilities, I think the strength in the Ranger more comes from their mobility um, and their sheer firepower, especially in the early game. Uh, shotguns do insane amount of damage, uh, really high crit chance built into them. Um, and if you're flanking appropriately and using good cover with them, Rangers are, are such a strong damage dealing class, especially in the early game. I find them pretty invaluable. So moving into the Grenadier, I'm also gonna place them up in S tier. Um, in that Grenadiers destroy so much cover especially early game um, when that is incredibly valuable and oftentimes it will when you're running into four health troopers and or even an advent officer which typically has um, seven health in the early game if you can deal damage to either of those targets if you roll nothing but a three a, a low roll on your on your grenade damage dealt um oftentimes the officer will have four health remaining which will get one shot by pretty much any unit other than the uh, the skirmisher down here, unless he rolls high with his bullpup. And the troopers will have one health remaining. So if you have a less accurate class, like say the, uh, the specialist here with an assault rifle with a stock on it, you don't even have to hit and you can still kill it. Or you can just hit it with another grenade from a grenadier and finish off the enemies. Um, their abilities early game with you know, Shredder um, are fantastic. The The second tier in the uh, in the, the Grenadier class in Suppression and I can't remember the name of the other one, but the one that destroys cover, I think it's Demolition. Um, as I mentioned, I don't value those too highly, but just for the, the ability to deny Advent cover, especially early game, is amazing. Um, so moving into... Uh, let's just stick with the the uh, XCOM classes first. Uh, PsyOps won't come in until late game because you realistically can't use them until late game. So ignore them here. I'm going to place the sharpshooter in... It's either high C, low B. So I'm just going to place them right here. Um, the reason that... I would place Sharpshooter kind of between C and B is that they are very useful for pulling in pods of enemies. Um, the way that I like to use a Sharpshooter in the early game um, is using the uh, Overwatch ability on them with uh, Long Sight, which basically just means they don't have to have line of sight on an enemy pod in order to take an Overwatch shot as long as another uh, unit of yours can see them. So oftentimes I'll use... Um, either a ranger in concealment or a reaper in concealment to 
uh, after uh, my whole team has been brought out of concealment, I'll use the, the scout to observe the enemy's movements. And as long as they move, the sharpshooter will shoot at them, um, bringing the pod, one, closer to me, um, but two, also giving me a free round of overwatch shots to get in some free damage on them. Um, problems with the sharpshooter, especially in the early game, is you can't move them very aggressively to use their sniper rifle. Um, as I've mentioned previously in my guide series, I usually just give them a flashbang. That way they have some utility, um, especially because of how large the explosive radius on the flashbang is. Um, you don't really have to have a sharpshooter up on the front line to make use of that. And for that, uh, simple fact that you can get free overwatch shots on, on enemy pods using the sharpshooter, I think that's a very strong ability for them. Um, Moving into the specialist, I'm going to place them in B. I'm going to rate them higher than the sharpshooter uh, early game for the simple fact that um, XCOM definitely does struggle the most early game. Um, and if you're going to be taking damage on your units more often than not, if, if you're, I, I shouldn't say you're going to be taking them uh, more damage in the early game, um, but more critical damage to where it, it threatens the life of your soldiers. Um, more often than not, that's typically going to be in the early game where your your grenadiers, your rangers, sharpshooters, hero classes all have five health unless you run some uh, resistant ring operations to get them some bonus health. Um, the fact that you can heal pretty much all the damage that they're going to take from advent, very, very useful. Um, if, if this ability to uh, heal your troops carried over into the main campaign and you didn't have to have them rest afterwards after they took damage, I would easily put them in S tier, especially for early game. Um, I don't place a huge emphasis on hacking mechs, um, as I've mentioned before. So um, the fact that specialists are very useful for some of the objectives in the early game, uh, making when, you're, when your team is at their weakest, the ability to reach consoles that you need to hack from a distance without triggering extra pods when you're already in a fight and you have maybe one turn to hack that objective, it's incredibly powerful. Um, and for that reason, I placed the specialist in B tier. So moving on to the Spark. Um, technically speaking, if you're not trying to go for a flawless run, you can get the Spark immediately after Gate Gatecrasher. Or I shouldn't say after Gatecrasher, but as soon as you unlock the ability to scan the tower uh, for, for Shen's mission. So Spark is definitely a, a unit you, you can have for the early game. Um, I'm going to place the Spark in A tier for a, a an early game playthrough. Um, Having a launcher, a rocket launcher, and the ability to shoot three times with decent accuracy in the early game is incredibly strong. Um, also, the Spark comes with armor built in on it, which makes it a little bit tankier and can help you uh, let your troops rest a little bit more in between missions, uh, which, especially if you don't have an infirmary, the, the wait times on your troops recovering can be pretty lengthy. So the, the spark is very useful for, for having that. Um, just really good damage dealer. Um, the cannon also shreds. So you have an additional form of, of dealing with armor instead of a grenadier. Um, for those few reasons, I think the spark is very useful in the A tier. Uh, moving into the hero classes. I'm going to put the Reaper up at A as well. Um, the reason I'm not going to put the Reaper up in S tier just quite yet is while, the, the to me, the most important unlocks for Reaper are within the first two level tiers, that uh, being Remote Start and... Um, Oh, I mean, really Remote Start, just for the additional explosives along with Claymores. Um, a lot of the times, especially early, I feel very reluctant to to shoot with my my Reaper uh, until I have uh, silent uh, silent kills, so that I don't have to worry about revealing my Reaper, especially in very compromising situations. Um, they're very very powerful in that remote start can deal insane amount of damage on large clumps of enemies. The problem being that 
you have to get them within range of the explosives first and second if you're if you're not in concealment a lot of the times advent will move into cover that is typically going to be away from things that you can blow up unless you're in a large urban map where there are a ton of cars laying around um a lot of the times, especially in like the sewer maps, um, I really struggle to find things that I can remote start with the Reaper. Um, now, that being said, having a scout is incredibly important, especially on Iron Man uh, legendary playthroughs. Being able to find where the pods are and making sure that you're not going to activate those pods is pretty invaluable. So for that reason alone, I would place the Reaper in, uh, in the A tier. So moving on to the Skirmisher make this a little bit smaller so it's not there we go um skir skirmisher i'm going to place an s as well um skirmisher is so incredibly mobile and also has again not the best unlocks until a little bit later but what, what it's working with even at its base um the ability to grapple up and get an aim bonus and then shoot twice at an enemy is pretty insane um the the skirmishers definitely struggle a little bit later on in the game where fights can be a little bit more drawn out but especially in the early game when you're dealing with low health enemies um the the fact that you can nearly but not reliably one shot troopers um one to two troopers depending on how good your damage rules are um is is pretty invaluable especially with the the ability to get aim bonuses um, on your on your skirmisher uh, and then finally moving into the templar i'm going to put templar up in s tier again um, rangers are incredibly good for their damage templars have that damage while it's locked solely behind their ability to melee um, they have untouchable a better version of uh untouchable at their first unlock which is pretty insane um, as long as you're careful about not un, uh, activating extra pods, um, I think this is a fantastic unit. Um, probably one of the strongest units in the game, um, especially early game. So now we've talked about the early game. Let's go ahead and reset our little markers here as best as we can. And we'll talk about the mid game. Now, just to reiterate, the mid game to me typically is when I have armor level 2 unlocked. Um, but for this tier list, I, I want to uh, stress that it's it's the, I want to say, the sergeant and lieutenant abilities. Or is it the lieutenant and captain? Yeah, lieutenant and captain abilities um, for, for XCOM. Um, and the reason that being is you can definitely have a colonel within, before you even have armor. Uh, armor 2 if you want if you want to uh, send a particular unit on uh, resistant ring operations that give you a promotion over and over again that's entirely possible but for the sake of fairness and just for a good comparison sake I feel that saying lieutenant and captain traits uh, are the best way to compare all these units so not unsurprising I'm going to place ranger and grenadier up here again in, in S tier um, let's start with the, the ranger um, so, with the uh, lieutenant and captain ranks, um, you have even more. Let me pull up the ranger just so I can show you the abilities. Just in case people have forgotten. Um, Commander, the media whoops. is a powerful tool. Did not want to do that. Um, having running gun, one of the strongest abilities in the game, as I had mentioned earlier. Um, and then having Im Implaceable and Bladestorm. While these aren't necessarily the, the greatest of uh, abilities, they're, they're very, very strong and uh, a good utility piece for the Ranger. Now, another reason that I say the, the mid-game would be armor level 2 is this also allows you to put different ammo types um, onto your, your soldier classes without giving up a grenade slot. So for the Ranger, this allows you to put, say, Talon Rounds on them, which are incredibly, incredibly powerful, um, depending on whether you have the Shard Gun, which is the second tier of the shotgun, or just the regular shotgun. 
your your damage will go through the roof, especially with those talent rounds. Um, really, really strong uh, ability to deal out extra damage, and uh, yeah, just fantastic unit for for dealing out damage and uh, being incredibly mobile. Um, Grenadier, we're gonna have things like Chain Shot um, unlocked at this uh, this tier here. Um, volatile mix, heavy ordnance, hollow targeting. Again, the the benefit of grenadiers is destroying cover, and uh, the unlocks that you get at the lieutenant and captain ranks make them even stronger. Um, for that reason alone, just denying XCOM cover is to, at least to me always going to make uh, grenadiers an S tier pick. Um, however, things like chain shot, as I mentioned earlier, allow you to deal so much DPS especially if you throw on like a superior scope and have a little bit of aim training on your Grenadier, um, it virtually cancels out the, uh, well, I mean, it does cancel out the, the aim penalty that you get from Chain Shot, and you can deal insane amounts of, of uh, targeted DPS. Uh, moving into the Sharpshooter, I'm going to place the Sharpshooter between B and A tier. Um, more so for Gunslinger, um, which... Or I'm sorry, uh, quick draw. Um, once you throw blue screen rounds on your your sharpshooter, take uh, take a sharpshooter with a uh, an un unupgraded pistol on on Shen's mission on the on the tower. If you uh, want to see how effective quick draw can be, also with lightning hands. Um, with this ability, if you're doing uh, that mission with Shen, for example, you can one shot the the mechs there. Uh, so you can essentially kill three enemy mechs with a, a lightning hands, a quick draw, and then a regular pistol shot. Incredibly, incredibly strong abilities. Um, Death from above is just nice um, uh, a bonus for throwing out more chances to kill targets. Um, sure, you're probably going to be using a regular sniper rifle uh, to score the kill, and then you might be able to get a little bit of chip damage in with the pistol. Uh, but again... The ability to pull pods is incredibly powerful for the the sharpshooter. Um, highly, highly recommend throwing blue screen rounds on them and just using them as a mech destroyer um, for your for your playthroughs if you care to try that. Um, I want to say the white mechs are one shot. Yeah, so I want to say the upgraded pistol can one shot. Uh, the white mechs, the advent mechs, and then they can two-shot the red mechs when you first started running into them. Um, so relying on the pistol, incredibly, incredibly powerful for the sharpshooter, and you can pull pods, really, really strong unit. Um, again, psyops are not going to count until late game, and then we have the specialist I'm going to place down here in C tier. Um, they, when you start getting more and more powerful i feel like their abilities just fall off drastically um field medic just as more of the same medical protocol um scanning protocol as i mentioned i don't think i've ever used uh threat assessment while there is something to be said about uh giving overwatch to your allies um i just don't value the the reactive sort of play style that the the specialist gives you um and usually by this at this point in the game, I don't really need the ability to hack targets from a distance in order to make effective use of my, my team on timed missions. Um, so moving into the spark, I'm going to place the spark up here in A tier again. Um, now with the spark, we have things like Wrecking Ball and Bombard. As I mentioned, Bombard is useful. It's essentially just another explosive that you can use. Um, but still, just the fact that at, at this point, while no, you can't get an additional unlock slot for the Spark, um, like you can with all the other troops with armor level 2, um, the the cannon is just so effective at dealing out a large amount of damage before Avid really starts to get major health buffs on them. Um, excuse me, um, that I, I still value the, the Spark's ability to deal with multiple targets um, and take a large number of turns 
um, or ta uh, take a large number of actions within a turn. Um, Reaper, at this point, I'm going to throw up into S tier. Um, major for major reason for that being is the uh, the abilities like uh, Silent Killer, up uh, which is unlocked here in the Lieutenant Tree. Um, Soul Harvesting, Needle, and Distraction. As I mentioned, these are all somewhat good, um, but Silent Killer, um, as I had mentioned in the early game tier list, is the one thing that kind of is missing from the Reaper to allow it to play a little bit more uh, proactive role in being a damage dealer. Um, moving into the Templar, I'm also going to rank this in the A tier. Um, just even more benefit than what we had previously in the fact that you have additional ways to protect your Templar and deflect. You also have nice abilities like the focus and reflect and channel. Um, this just allows the Templar to do more damage, um, be more survivable, and just keep doing what it does well even better. Um, and then moving into the Skirmisher, I'm probably going to put the Skirmisher here in B tier. Um, it's about this point where the Skirmisher, I feel, starts to fall off a little bit just because of the bullpup and how limiting it is to um, the effectiveness of your Skirmishers. But um, you do get Whiplash and things like Comet Presence and Retribution. However, uh, uh, you know what, let's, let's place it between B and A. Um, this is definitely the point where I, I do feel like the Skirmisher starts to fall off a little bit, but those abilities are incredibly strong. It's just that at this point, Advent typically starts to get its health buffs, and unless you have the, um, the second tier of weaponry for the bullpup, which is this one right here, um, it just feels like you don't deal enough damage. Um, six to seven isn't a whole lot, especially when you start having targets with armor and things like that. Um, and then the the beam one is even worse because you only really get one extra uh, reliable point of damage. Um, but moving into our late tier list here, move these back down here again. I'm just gonna leave these up here because you guys already know Ranger and Grenadier are still gonna be up here. Um, Starting with the Ranger, um, show you their abilities just in case you forgot. Um, Untouchable, I've been saying how much I love this ability over and over again. Uh, deep Cover, as I had mentioned previously, I don't find very useful. And then Colonel, two incredibly strong abilities for the Ranger unlocked at this tier. Um, yeah, just again, really, really strong DPS, really good mobility. Um, and especially when you're running Talon rounds with a uh, storm cannon, which is the beam version of the shotgun, you can be dealing 17, 18 damage to a uh, to a target. So incredibly strong uh, burst damage on enemies at a somewhat, or I should say, fairly reliable rate. Uh, moving into the grenadier, and I apologize because I just realized I didn't show these for the for the corporal and sergeant abilities, but um, hopefully I. I reminded you of, of the abilities well enough but um the fact that you get salvo um basically just means that the grenadier can do again what it does really well denying the enemy cover um while also have having the ability to use chain shot or rupture or saturation fire um all within the same turn is really really strong action economy um you get to deny enemy cover and do a lot of burst damage to enemies so um, that's why I place the Grenadier up in S tier, even for late game. Um, Sharpshooter. In the late game, I definitely would consider S tier as well. Um, especially since we have things like the Icarus suit in the game. Um, but we'll get to that. Even without the Icarus suit, it, the Sharpshooter can be pretty insane, especially because of Serial. Um, City Hands, as I mentioned, is pretty decent because you're going to be sitting in one location um, a lot of the time and fan fire is also an incredibly incredibly strong ability for that um, blue screen pistol dps roll for the sharps here um, just remember eight to ten damage is a pretty significant amount of single target dps um, 
to be to be used with serial. So just keep that in mind. Um, and then moving into the psyops, psyops is easily one of the strongest units in the game. Um, the only reason, and I know this is kind of blasphemy, uh, I'm going to place them between S and A tier for the sole reason that it takes so long to get psyops fully online. Um, a majority of the time, I feel like I could have ended a campaign easily, you know, two or three months before my PSYOP had all of his abilities unlocked. Now, if you want to run a PSYOPs without having all of his abilities, then that's perfectly fine. And sure, he might be, or she might be a little bit less effective than, than normal, but uh, more than likely, likely you can still use the PSYOP without one or two abilities for their main role of controlling enemies, um, crowd controlling, dealing lots of DPS to um, clumps of enemies, things like that. Uh, specialists, no surprise here. I'm going to place down in C tier again. Um, again, far, far too reactive of a role for my liking. Um, Guardian, it relies on Overwatch, and it's not even a guarantee that you'll take extra shots. Um, capacitor Discharge and Restoration are great, but other classes can do say capacitor discharge that can deal with a large number of robotic enemies just as well as as this ability uh, if not better with things like um, the reaper throwing out uh, multiple claymores on a group of high armored enemies and then blowing two claymores up will usually kill a lot of those enemies or chain shotting a sec uh, sectoid or excuse me sectopod um, is going to do way more damage than capacitor distar discharge, especially with blue screen rounds. Um, so again, for that reason, I don't I don't value specialist all that much. Um, for the Reaper, um, well, yes, I was saying how much I enjoy Banish um, for the ability to one shot very scary targets like the Chosen and Sector. Uh, sect pods and, and things like that um it's not reliable um yes you get an additional claim war which is fantastic and really brings the ranger into their or excuse me the the uh, uh reaper into their own but um the ranger can essentially do the dps job of the um of the reaper here uh, just a little bit more efficiently, in my opinion. Um, the, the main problem with the Reaper is after you use, you use up your two Claymores or your one Claymore, if you didn't take the upgrade for them, um, you have Banish, and that's on a cooldown. And then you have a Sniper Rifle, which while, yes, you can shoot while moving, but it doesn't deal all that much damage. Um, if we look at the damage on the... Uh, the beam sniper rifle it does five to six damage which is pretty pitiful especially for a beam weapon late game um moving into skirmishers i'm gonna place them in b tier um as i mentioned in the uh the mid game tier list this mid mid game is kind of when skirmishers start to fall off a little bit and these abilities don't really help them out all that much. Um, manual overdrive is really nice, or excuse me, override is really nice for lowering cooldowns. But other than that, you just don't get a whole lot. Um, and their their primary weapon just doesn't deal insane amount uh, an insane amount of damage, which you could use a sharpshooter for with serial or uh, a grenadier with chain shot or a reaper or excuse me, a ranger with their shotgun if you don't want to be cooldown dependent. Or just use a Templar, which at this point does insane amount of damage, especially with Deep Focus, which gives you one extra focus to uh, give you even more melee damage. Also at that, um, at, at the late game, you get the ability to bring in a ghost, which gives you even more DPS um, with with Rend on a, on a second Templar, essentially. Um, and Ionic Storm is fantastic, especially if you have Arc Wave, then you can have two Rens with Arc Storm just demolish pods. Um, yeah, Templars are insane. Highly, highly 
I, I really value Templars just as much as I do Rangers or Grenadiers. And then we have the Spark. Um, Spark, I'm going to place about the same area as Skirmishers. And um, that the main reason for that being is that the last abilities that they get in Hunter Protocol and... Oh, wait, these are locked. Whoops. Um, well, Nova is um, one of them, and then I forget the name of the other one, but... Uh, sacrifice, there we go. Um, yeah, these, these abilities just don't do a lot. I really like Hunter Protocol and the fact that it feels like I get an Overwatch shot every single time a, a pod activates near me. Um, but other than that, um, Sacrifice is really beneficial, but it's a lot of the time I feel like I can deal with pods very efficiently late game, and I don't really need the extra bonuses from from that. So, um, yeah, that's that's the tier list. Um, let me know what you guys think. I know this was really long, and I probably rambled a whole lot, so uh, hopefully the timestamps down below kind of make this a little bit more tolerable for you guys because I'm sure it was a little bit long-winded. But uh, let me know your guys' opinions. Um, I'm definitely curious to hear what you guys think. Um, also just want to hear how you would place some of these classes. Um, at the end of the day, this is all just my opinion, and I'm more than welcome to or more than open to hearing your opinions about what you think is um, your favorite classes and why. So um, let me know down below. Uh, but hopefully you guys enjoy this, and I will see you in the next one.